In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our lessons this fall, these next few weeks, have a common theme. They are about how we relate to each other. In today's epistle, we heard, O oh, one, no one, anything, except the obligation to love. So what is our best example of love? Well, it's Jesus. He said to his followers at his last meal with them, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. We need to understand how much God really loves us. Because you can't give someone else what you don't possess. If you understand God's incredible, indescribable love for you, you're likely to be much more loving of other people. So today, we're going to do two things. We're going to explore four ways in which God's and Jesus's, uh, uh, four meanings of God's and Jesus's love for you. And then we're going to have a reminder of how to pass it on. So the first thing is that we have to accept others as Jesus accepts us. The deepest wounds in life are the wounds of rejection, being mocked, betrayed, belittled, whether it's by parents, friends, fellow professionals, former spouse. There's a big myth in the lives of human beings today. If I were just perfect, y'all would love me. Obviously, you don't love me. Thank you. Thank you. Voice in the wilderness. Thank you. I had to milk it for something, right? See, that's just wrong. If I were just perfect, y'all would love me. Jesus was perfect. And he was nailed on a cross. No matter what you do, someone won't like you. Starting point for loving people is realizing how much God loves you and accepts you. And how much is that? Again, in John's Gospel, Jesus said, The Father has given them, has given me, excuse me, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. I have come down from heaven to do the Father's will not my own, and that is that I should not lose one of them. That is unconditional love, unconditional acceptance. Do you realize that Jesus has accepted you? Many Christians go through life and do not believe that God accepts them. Instead, they believe that God is always putting them down, is always on their case, is always blaming them. They believe that no matter what we, I do, I'll never be good enough. But that's not from God. That comes from conditional love. Because human beings don't always love unconditionally. What we learn in our human life is, if you do this, then I'll love you. And that's conditional love. But God says, no. I love you, period. I love you because of who I am, not because of what you've done, but because of what I, God, have done. So we have to learn to love in the way that God loves us. In Titus, 
Paul wrote that because of Jesus' grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we would inherit eternal life. That has nothing to do with you having to be perfect. You may think you're perfect today, but I promise you, you're going to sin tomorrow. Jesus said, I'm making you acceptable by my grace, not your performance. And God wants you to do that to other people. He wants you to treat them as acceptable. The problem is that we human beings don't know the difference between acceptance and approval. Jesus accepts you completely, and he loves you. Doesn't mean he approves of everything you do. How do you accept someone without approving? Well, think of the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus looked at the elders in the village and he said, anyone who has never sinned, throw the first stone. And immediately they all started going away. What was Jesus doing here? Giving acceptance, not approval. He gave her acceptance because he defended her dignity. See, that's also what Matthew is getting at in his gospel this morning. When you correct a believer, you are accepting them. You're respecting and defending their dignity. You see, when you come to Jesus and you've messed up in your life, so you come to him with your sins, your faults, your failures, Jesus isn't going to look you in the eye and say, see, I told you so. The first thing he does is defend your dignity. In the story of the woman caught in adultery, the elders walked away, and in a one-on-one -on -one moment, Jesus looked at the woman and said, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? She replied, no, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I. Go and sin no more. He didn't give her an eight-point sermon on adultery. He didn't tell her she's evil, she's wicked, she's mean, she's nasty, she's hurting herself, she's hurting him, she's hurting the kids, she's hurting everybody in the village. We don't have to make folks feel guilty. They do that on their own. We know that we don't measure up to our own standards, let alone God's. When you come to Jesus with your guilt, he doesn't say, yep, you're right. Instead, he accepts you. He defends your dignity and says, you know better. You are better. Don't do that anymore. And that's what we need to do with each other. We don't have to approve of everything everyone does, but we do have to accept them as Jesus accepts us because that's a mark of love. The God of love chose to accept us, to make us acceptable. Now we all know that being chosen is a big deal. It's a huge boost to self-esteem. Think back. Some of our younger people don't have to think back that far. But think back to when you were on the playground and you were the last kid chosen. You remember what you thought as the whole process was going through? God, please don't let me be last. Conversely, if you were the first one chosen, you thought you were hot stuff, didn't you? God chose you. So your spirits should soar. He said, I accept you. I love you. I created you. I sent Jesus to die for you. It really doesn't matter what others think. 
Our confidence doesn't come from, from listening to the approval of other people. It comes from listening to what God says about each one of us. What God does for you, he wants you and me to do for others. One way to show acceptance, look at people. It's the highest form of love. Looking someone in the face says, you matter to me. You're valuable. You go out for brunch after this, and the waitress brings your food, and you never look at her. You never say thank you. That says that you do not value that person. You do not accept that person. Looking at someone, especially true when you're going to confront an offender. Acceptance also listens to someone else. Their words, their fears, their doubts. We all have doubts. We doubt whether God's really there. We doubt about Jesus. We doubt about the Bible. We need to listen to that. So, your takeaway this week is to show acceptance to someone. Not your child, not your spouse, not your sibling. Choose someone that you have a very hard time accepting. Someone who's cantankerous, who's irritable. No immediate ideas of who that would be? Maybe it's you. You're thinking, Lord, I really don't want to accept him or her. I don't want to love them. Start thinking about how much God loves you and accepts you. The second thing that we have to do is we have to value others as Jesus values us. How valuable are you? That is your self-worth, not your net worth. You're infinitely valuable to God. He created you, sent his son to die for you, put his spirit in you, wants you to be with him forever in eternity. Any questions? Two things make something valuable. Who made it? And what someone will pay. Who made you? God. So you're valuable because God doesn't make junk. Paul said in Ephesians, we, meaning human beings, are God's masterpiece. We were created anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that God planned for us. You are God's masterpiece. Your value depends upon who made you. And what will someone pay how much is your house worth? I can assure you it is not worth as much as you think. It is worth what someone will pay for it. In 1 Peter, the writer said that, you know, God paid a ransom to save you from that empty life you inherited. Paid not with gold and silver, but with the precious blood of his sinless, spotless son, the Lamb of God. How much are you worth? Look at the cross. I know, growing up, folks probably may have told you that you were worthless. You didn't matter. You weren't going to amount to anything. That is a lie. That may have been your parents, but it's still a lie. You're not just worthy, you're not just acceptable, you are valuable. And Jesus wants you to treat others with the same type of value. How? Treat them with dignity. 
That's what we're told in 1 Peter. That's what we say in the baptismal covenant. Will we respect the dignity of every human being? That includes those with whom you agree, those with whom you disagree, those you like, and those you don't like. It includes the believer that you must correct. Everyone with dignity by looking at them, listening to them. You can't love someone without looking and listening. And love is a way of treating people with dignity. Even something as simple as being polite treats everyone with dignity. And yet, unfortunately, we live in a rude, unaccepting world. So your second takeaway, I will value, fill in the blank, this week. Name someone who is treated like dirt, an outcast, somebody who's treated as if they don't matter. Then you treat them as if they do. Because they do, they matter to God. The third thing is that we are called to forgive others as Jesus forgives. Some folks think that God carries grudges. That God is always mad at them. Does God really act that way? No. Think back to a time when everything went wrong. It might have been a day, it might have been a week, it could have been a year. Think back to that time, and what did you probably do? You jabbed your finger up at the sky, and you said, why me, God? Why me? And did the voice from heaven come down and say, because some people just really tick me off. Uh, no. Jesus paid it all. So now, as Paul says in Romans, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation. But that, of course, was not at no cost. The cost came with the blood of Jesus. He gave his life so that you and I could be forgiven. Do you understand that God has forgiven you? That enables and strengthens you to go forgive others. Take a good look at yourself. See your ugliness, your selfishness, your sin. Then take a good look, a really good look at God and see the forgiveness that only He can give. Get that forgiveness into your life because then you can give it to others. Third takeaway, who would you forgive this week? And then the last thing is that we must believe in others as Jesus believes in us. We live in a world full of insecure people. Frequently, the more successful you are, the more insecure a person feels. But Jesus affirmed all the folks around him. He didn't see what they were. He saw what they could become. Think about this for a minute. Jesus entrusted the entire world to 12 guys. Okay, I know one flamed out at the end. But he entrusted the world to these guys, normal guys. No high school, no college, no postgraduate degree. But for three, three years, 
He said, you know, guys, I believe in you. You can do this. Take this message to the whole world. Again, in Romans this morning, we heard, owe nothing except your obligation to love one another. To be a world-class lover, we must show acceptance, we must value others, we must forgive others, we must believe in others. Psychologists tell us that our self-image is largely determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. So make Jesus the most important person in your life. Because he says you're valuable, you're acceptable, you're lovable, you're forgivable, and you're capable. You know, the admonition in, in Matthew's gospel about speaking to an offender, it's really easy. It's easy when folks are viewed as valuable, acceptable, lovable, forgivable, and capable. When we believe that, we look them in the eye and we point out their offense. We'll take members of the community if it's necessary. And folks who believe that they are lovable, acceptable, forgivable, capable, will receive that instruction for the same reason. When they don't, go back and reread Matthew 18, 15 to 20 for your edification. There is no doubt that you have wounds, doubts, you've been hurt. They may have come from peers, from parents, from siblings, but God cares about each one of you. He wants you to make Jesus the most important person in your life. He wants you to fill your life with what Jesus says. Let his love flow into your life. Because we can't fulfill the obligation to love, including pointing out an offense, without first knowing how much God loves each and every one of us. Amen.